All right, so we are in Acts chapter 13. As we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Acts, we saw that Saul and Barnabas had been teaching the new believers at Antioch, and it included many Gentiles. They were referred to as Hellenists uh, in the book of Acts. And, and a prophecy by Agabus was fulfilled when a famine struck Judea. And so Paul and Barnabas collected an offering to take to Jerusalem. And so they have done that. And John Mark, who was the son of the woman in whose home the apostles in Jerusalem were headquartered, uh, came back to Antioch with them. Uh, and he was also the cousin of Barnabas. As we move into chapter 13, we shall discover that uh, from that time forward, the gospel being preached to the Gentiles uh, became more and more prevalent, marking the beginning of Paul's primary calling in ministry and mission. It's, he's still initially referred to here in chapter 13 as Saul of Tarsus, and, but uh, as we get to the middle of the chapter, he'll be called Paul, and then he's called Paul for the rest of the book of Acts. So that's his Roman name. Uh, that uh, is congruent with his primary mission uh, to the Gentile world. Uh, so uh, he was known mostly as Paul, which is his Roman name. Uh, chapter 13 also brings a fresh focus on the Holy Spirit, the invisible presence of God, again to be the central place of understanding that we are led by the Spirit, where the Holy Spirit speaks to us and helps us and guides us. It's, a, it's the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus told his disciples about in John chapter 14 and then again in Acts chapter 1. Uh, but the promise will be fulfilled through the coming of the Holy Spirit as their comforters, their guide, and it would em empower them to be witnesses of his all through the world. And so uh, in, in these verses, we are told that the Holy Spirit speaks we are also told that the Holy Spirit calls people to specific ministry and then that the Holy Spirit sends people out from the church into the world. Uh, one of the longings of my heart is that I, along with the other believers today, would become more acutely aware of the Holy Spirit's voice and guidance and understanding what is the will of the Lord. And, and just anything, really. Uh, and, and it's like when the Holy Spirit uh, comes and shows us God's way, it's like the fog lifting. And a lot of us wind up kind of feeling like we're in a fog about something. And then when the Holy Spirit comes, it's like the fog lifts. And we're able to see the road ahead. And so uh, the Holy Spirit, you might say, is a fog lifter. So let's look at uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who has been brought up with, uh, had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed they laid, and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now we are not told which of these men were prophets and which ones uh, were teachers. The role of a prophet included preaching from the Old Testament uh, scriptures, prediction, giving warnings, giving uh, Holy Spirit inspired messages to the church, uh, especially for encouragement, choosing of individuals for specific ministries. Uh, many of the prophets were itinerant. In other words, they went from place to place, city to city, from church to church. And then oftentimes they would stay, settle into a community of belie uh, believers for a season of time. And apparently that's what had happened here in Antioch. There were also teachers. These were individuals who were especially gifted by the Holy Spirit to teach God's word, to feed the flock, to explain the scriptures, and to uh, teach the doctrines that Christ and the apostles had passed on. Apostle had passed on to the church. You remember back in Acts chapter two, they were devoted to the instruction or the the doctrine or the teachings of the apostles. One needs only to read the writings of Paul to understand that he was a very gifted teacher. Uh, it was already noted that both Paul and Barnabas were teachers because they had been doing that in the church at Antioch for at least a year at this time. In the American church culture, for many years, the emphasis has really been upon topical preaching. And people are often motivated or inspired by that. And these messages can be immensely encouraging. And I'd love to hear messages that are encouraging. Uh, and, but however, because of the lack of teaching, 
Too many have remained immature in their Christian walk and have been easily discouraged in faith. And this is why it's so important to study the Bible, to teach from the scriptures, and to verse-by-verse -verse studies that can be of such great value in understanding God's ways and helping us grow up in Christ. Now, who were these men? There was Barnabas from Cyprus. We've heard about him already as a son of encouragement. He was such a generous man for those in need. And then there was Simeon of Niger, meaning that he was a black African. He was thought to be perhaps the man who carried the cross for Jesus as he was headed to Calvary. And then there was Lucius from northern Africa. And then Manion, he is thought to have been the foster brother of Herod Antipas. Who was Herod Antipas? He was the very Herod that had tried Jesus. A Pilate sent Jesus to him to be tried because he was from Galilee. And, and then Herod sent him back to Pilate. Uh, and that this man apparently was a foster brother of Herod Antipas, which is a rather interesting thing, isn't it? Because here you have one of the main leaders in the church at Antioch who had been a foster brother perhaps to the very Herod Antipas that we looked at uh, before the crucifixion of Jesus. The, the Holy Spirit has a powerful way of changing people's lives. Uh, then you have Saul of Tarsus, who we now are going to be thinking of as Paul, the apostle. Now, note here how diverse these guys were. Uh, there was no self-proclaimed supremacy of race. You hear a lot about that nowadays. No self-proclaimed supremacy of race or ethnicity that was present among these early believers. Uh, where the Holy Spirit dwells, guys, there are to be no prejudicial walls between people groups. God brings people together. He doesn't separate them from one another. Uh, so we see that this is the work of, of God. Now, these men were the leadership core of the church at Antioch, and they ministered to the Lord, meaning that they worshiped the Lord in prayer and fasted together for direction from the Holy Spirit. Now, fasting is an interesting thing. Uh, it is always mentioned in relationship to prayer. Prayer and fasting, or fasting and prayer, or worship, and had a specific purpose. These men were concerned about taking the gospel to other places, in the cities especially surrounding them, and on into the rest of the world, which had been the call of God upon all of them. And, and they were seeking the Lord about who to send out to preach the gospel. So fasting meals uh, was to, to give them opportunity to focus in prayer and worship, in a way that sharpened the focus of their hearts to hear from the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, several questions about hearing from the Holy Spirit come to mind here. First of all, to whom did the Holy Spirit speak? Well, there are several possibilities. It's possible that the Holy Spirit spoke to one of these five men so that he could tell the others and the church what he was hearing from the Lord. And then uh, it's possible that it was uh, the Holy Spirit spoke this plan that is being given to the hearts of all of these five men so that they simultaneously were impressed with what the Holy Spirit wanted them to do. Or a prophetic word may have been spoken to the entire church uh, at Antioch by one of these five men that was accepted as the word, a word from the Lord. There was a sense of agreement uh, or peace or conviction in their hearts that this was a word from God. Now, what did the Holy Spirit, question number two, what did the Holy Spirit tell them to do? The record here is vague, except that there was a specific calling upon Barnabas and Paul to be set apart for the purpose of being sent out for some ministry. Now, until this point, until the Holy Spirit spoke to them, you could have perhaps heard them discussing, well, who should go out? You know, should it be Lucius and Manning that should go out? Or should it be uh, Barnabas and one of the other men in the church? Or uh, who should go out? But as they asked this question, who should go? Then the Holy Spirit began to clarify you know, who was to go out? And so they agreed that it was Paul and Barnabas that were to be set apart for this. Now, John Stott pointed out how God told Abram to leave his home country and go out. The scripture says, not knowing where he was going. Now, do you, do you see it being said here that, that Paul and Barnabas knew exactly where they were going when they were set apart for, for this calling and sent out? Doesn't say, does it? So they were just saying, we're willing to go and uh, we're going to go out and see where the Lord leads us. God doesn't always tell us where we're going, does he? But he wants us to be ready to go when it's time. So, you know, somehow impressed upon the church community that Paul and Barnabas were, were to go out, yet not knowing exactly where they would be going. Uh, there was a time in my young adult life that I knew that there was a calling to teach and minister the Word of God. But, uh, you know, I did not know where or how that was to be done as yet. 
One step at a time took place in my life uh, as to where and how it became revealed to me. And there were a lot of surprises in that, I have to tell you. Uh, that I would not have chosen the path that I took, especially in the early years of ministry. I would not have chosen that path at all. But God chose it, and I'm so excited to tell you it was wonderful. And God did blessed because, you know, he made the way and opened the door. So uh, uh, these things were surprising, yet very rewarding uh, as I look back upon them. Now, listen, I cannot speak strongly enough about the importance of hearing from the Holy Spirit for each and every one of us. Uh, every decision in life that's, that's serious and important to us, the Holy Spirit wants to help us with that and give us God's understanding of it and open our eyes to see. It certainly saves us the grief from making bad choices when we listen to the Holy Spirit leading us and giving us that wisdom. I have at times leaned on past experience to say, well, this is what I've always done, so I'll do that, you know. Uh, or my own self-sufficiency, you know, I'm, I'm a decision maker, and so this is what I'm going to decide to do. Uh, and, or just overthinking things, and, or, or listening to too many people, you know, and before you know it, I'm in kind of a fog, and I'm not sure what to do at all. <laughs> and then I make a choice, and it's not really what maybe the Lord would have done, and I have a regret about it later. So uh, it's, it's very important to uh, understand that the Holy Spirit sees what we cannot see. And God sees way down the road for us. He understands what's going on around us and what's before us. So he sees what we cannot see. And when we clearly receive direction from the Holy Spirit, it is confirmed by others, things work together much better. So we see that the Holy Spirit is a fog lifter. We're in a fog, wait for him to lift the fog, and then you can see. Now, I am impressed by how Paul and Barnabas did not independently decide uh, what they were going to do. They waited for confirmation by the Holy Spirit in the hearts of others before they decided that. This reminds us that we do not live for and serve the Lord in isolation. Okay? Uh, there is an interdependence within the body of Christ under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And all through the writings of Paul, he talks about this, and especially in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he notes here that for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So if God's, uh, you know, uh, sometimes somebody might come up to me and say, well, I believe the Lord wants you to do such and such a thing. Well, I think the Lord's going to tell me that too, don't you? Before, you know, I'll listen and I'll pray about it. Then sometimes you have to go back and say, well, the Lord didn't tell, didn't tell me to do that. <laughs> you know, let's, why don't you go pray some more too? You know, so you know, the, it's going to be a confirmation thing through other members of the body. Uh, so the same Spirit of God works in all of us to convince us what is the will of God about a matter. So let's look again here at what the Holy Spirit did for them. First of all, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Now, back in the 90s, uh, as I've told you recently about, we were in need of a facility to meet in. And the Holy Spirit impressed upon me that we should purchase a property over on Bluebird Drive. And as a gathering place for our fellowship. I did not try to convince our board of trustees that that's what we should do. I believe that that was the Lord's work to do the convincing. But I did invite them to meet with me at that property early one Sunday morning. And you know what? Every single board member, there were about 10 of us, every single board member confirmed that that was where the Lord wanted us to be. And uh, there was no sales job, none of that type, no heavy persuasion done, none of those kinds of things. I didn't bring out a chart, you know, show them why this was the best spot, you know, and the most strategic place, you know, to be. No, the Holy Spirit did the confirming in their hearts. So how do we know that we're hearing from the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, what we are hearing in our hearts will seem familiar to us. Jesus said that his sheep know his voice, and when they hear it, they will follow. So there's a familiarity about the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's, by the way, John chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. Uh, second, what we are hearing will not conflict with the known will of God, uh, such as is what's in Scripture. And third, what is heard from the Holy Spirit will be in the context of the peace of God. Uh, I, I use this constantly in my life, encourage others who are wondering what the Lord would want them to do about something. I always go back to this verse in Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God 
rule in your hearts, to which you also you were called in one body, and be thankful. So there's a peace of God that accompanies the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's a peace about it. There's a harmony with God, that sense of harmony with the Lord about the voice of the Holy Spirit. And fourth, the leading of the Holy Spirit will produce the environment of love that promotes unity and peace. Again, when, when the Lord is in something, it's going to bring people together. People who are seeking the Lord, fasting and praying or whatever, they're going to open their hearts to what is the will of the Lord. They're all going to lay down their agendas, their personal agendas about things. They're going to say, let's listen for the Lord's voice. And when they all hear it, then they'll say, yes, that's it. And we can all now do this together, you know, as one body and one community of believers. Now, the Holy Spirit called and set Paul and Barnabas apart for a specific work. It says, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, back in chapter 9, you may recall that Ananias, uh, God spoke to him and told him, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and told him that what had happened to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and, and that he had an encounter with Christ and that this man was set apart by God to carry the gospel to the predominantly Gentile world and even to kings, and even that he would suffer many things. Now, that was 10 years earlier, and the time has come for Paul to go. Uh, just as Saul and Barnabas were set apart as missionaries to the unreached, predominantly Gentile cities, the Lord wants us set apart, each one of us, to be set apart in ministry as well. There are some of us who are called in various ways. All of us are called in various ways and set apart for various ministries of, of preaching or teaching or encouragement and mercy giving. All those ministry gifts that are listed in Romans chapter 12, just go there sometime and take a look at it. Uh, mercy giving, children's ministry, practical helps, funding ministry, hospitality, ministry to people with addiction issues, apologetics, journalism, music and worship, art, filmmaking. Uh, and and I, as I think about it, there are people in our congregations, as small as we are, there are people in our congregation who represent every one of those groups I just mentioned. And they're serving the Lord in every one of those groups, that calling that they've received in those ways. And it's a beautiful thing to be called and set apart for a specific ministry. I'm reminded of my wife, Vicki's grandmother, Mama Jeannie. Yeah, I had the privilege of conducting her memorial service back in 2002. And she was 92 years of age lived a life of testimony unto to the Lord. And, and uh, she was a woman who had dedicated her life to serving the Lord. And she made a missions trip to Mexico. Uh, she held Bible clubs for kids after school. That was a calling she believed she had from the Lord, uh, leading many of those children into a relationship with Christ. Several were at the visitation the evening before her service. And I, I was able to interact with them. And I was amazed. I didn't know all that about her, you know. And so, and I'm told that she received letters from many of those who had received Christ under her ministry uh, for all those years. Uh, and so she also was very instrumental in helping to start a couple of churches. Uh, she had a calling and a dedication of herself to that calling. So now let's go back to Barnabas and Saul. Uh, Mama Jeannie's testimony is good, but their testimony is very expensive. You know, very great. You know, it's a, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke. The Holy Spirit called or set them apart. And now the Holy Spirit sent them out. Okay? So in verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they, call, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Uh, this is John Mark, the son of the woman who... Uh, had the headquarters home there in Jerusalem for the uh, apostles there. Uh, Barnabas and Saul first went to places of familiarity. And that's not a bad plan to follow if the Holy Spirit sends you out, you know, to start with, with where you're familiar. Uh, Seleucia was like going from here to Gallatin. So if you leave here, you know, if you're living in Goodsville, the Holy Spirit says, I'm sending you out. Well, why not stop over in Gallatin? It's not far away, you know. And you might want to see if the Lord wants to, to do a ministry through you in Gallatin. So that's kind of what was going on here. Cyprus was the childhood home of Barnabas. So he went to a place that was very familiar to him. And finally they landed in Salamis, the main city on the island of Cyprus. And they had a green light there to preach the gospel. Verse 6 tells us, Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. 
This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the uh, sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, Paphos was the uh, capital city of Cyprus and was known for immorality and idolatry, as many of those cities were. Uh, he was the most influential man on the island uh, and uh, in the city. Uh, and it was describing him as interesting, described him as an intelligent man. Uh, but he was entertaining. You know, intelligence doesn't get you everywhere you need to go, does it? Because even though he was a very intelligent man, he was seeking wisdom from a sorcerer. Uh, and from a, a false Jewish prophet. Uh, so it's amazing how many intelligent people reach out to people like palm readers and psychics and, and all that. I've, had, I've known people who, who did that, and I always shake my head and wonder why. You know, you've got a, a very intelligent mind, and you can figure this out without going to somebody like a psychic, you know, to help you out. And, and so uh, instead of the knowledge and wisdom they had been given, it's likely that the proconsul was seeking spiritual truth. And he was seeking it through the sorcerer, and then he, he discovered that Paul and Barnabas were there, and he said, wow, they've got a lot to say. I want to hear what they have to say as well. The sorcerer called Elymas was under Satan's influence. So naturally, he tried to oppose the gospel being heard by the proconsul. Now, we, we often hear about this, don't we, where a person, a new believer, is so excited about their faith, and then, as you can imagine, there is an opponent of Christ that comes along and tries to convince them otherwise and lead them astray, lead them away from their faith. And keep that in mind. If you are familiar with, or maybe you've led somebody to the Lord, you know somebody is a new believer, you know, don't neglect to give them the support that they need uh, because they're going to need it from you. Uh, so continue to reach out to them and, and love them in the Lord and know that somebody else is reaching out to them who doesn't have Christ in mind and we'll try to lead them away. So keep, keep that in your mind as you know these people. And they need your, your continued attention. And maybe to disciple them in their faith. Verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for, for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So Paul and Barnabas got a little bit of extra help here uh, with this, uh, this sorcerer. And, and uh, so Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke prophetically to him. Uh, who was being used by the devil to try and circumvent the gospel being heard. And so again, we see here that a key element in sharing our faith uh, in speaking about Christ to anybody in the world is to be filled with the Spirit. And, and I believe, and you've heard me talk about this before, let's not be thinking that being filled with the Spirit is just this one-time thing in a believer's life. The Holy Spirit wants to keep on filling us, you know, over and over, especially at times when we need His assistance and proclaiming the gospel. And so Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, in the way that's constructed, uh, you'll find that that means that he had a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to speak to this man. Okay? There was a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon him to boldly speak to this sorcerer. And so then the darkness that fell on this man was symbolic, of course, to spiritual darkness. The proconsul believed that there is no doubt, uh, and there is no doubt that his testimony given... Uh, was that uh, as the highest Roman official in the area that would be key to the establishment of the church in Cyprus. Now, we are not told how long Barnabas and Saul stayed in each of these cities, but it was a pattern that they stayed long enough to establish a fellowship of believers. Then they would send for someone else to come in and pastor that group and care for them and disciple them. Just like Barnabas had been called to go to Antioch and disciple the new believers there. So this was a pattern that took place in church planting, if you please, you know, where uh, Paul and Barnabas would plant the church and then uh, others would come in and carry the church forward then in each community. Uh, so verse 13 continues the story. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. 
But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, it's a different Antioch, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So John Mark, this young man, this cousin of Barnabas, uh, decided to go home. Now we are not told why he decided to leave. Uh, we do learn later that Paul was pretty upset with him for leaving. Uh, we're not told why. Uh, perhaps he was still too much of a novice uh, to go on this trip with them. Uh, the, the ministry can be stressful. And if you're not prepared uh, for the stresses of the ministry like this especially, and the stresses that, and persecution they would encounter, uh, it would be tough. Or uh, perhaps he was just homesick for his mom, you know. Uh, and uh, I've been homesick a couple of times. Yeah, I bet you have too. So anyways, he went home. Another door of ministry opened in Asia Minor. In the Pisidian Antioch, uh, as was their custom, Paul and Barnabas decided to start teaching in the synagogue there. Uh, and the leader of the synagogue, perhaps recognizing that Paul had functioned as a rabbi, uh, he gave opportunity for him to speak to the people. Now what comes next is Paul's first recorded sermon in the scripture. Uh, it is given to a Jewish audience, and so it will actually be somewhat similar to, uh, familiar to you, it's somewhat similar to what we have heard from Peter and from Stephen. Linking the coming of Jesus, and the first coming, the incarnation, uh, with Jewish history and messianic prophecies from the Old Testament. So verse 16, then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen, the God of this people Israel chose your fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed Seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. That's all Jewish history. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And after John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now, you see here, you can say a lot in just a short period of time. <laughs> Did you notice that? He covered hundreds of years there in just a paragraph uh, of the, you know, reciting the history of, of Israel. And, and as John, verse 25, as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, son of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you, glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says to in another Psalm, you, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. There it is. And by him, everyone who believes is justified. Another powerful word is justified from all things from which you would not be justified by the law of Moses. So that's grace versus the law being Paul's already talking about it, that very thing that he unfolds so beautifully in the book of Romans. 
Uh, verse 40, Beware therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. He knew he was going to be subjected to at least a partially hostile audience here. In this sermon, Paul told of how it was prophesied that as a descendant of David, the Messiah would suffer and die and would be raised again. Paul closed his sermon with the great words of Christian faith, forgiveness of sins and justification, meaning the pardon of all guilt of sin came solely, no other way, but solely through Christ, not through the law of Moses. Salvation is by faith in the grace of God manifested through the atoning death of Jesus and his resurrection. So, wow. In just a short sermon, a powerful message. Verse 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. I have to tell you, I've not had too many people beg me to preach to them. You know, these people were hungry to hear the truth, you know. And so uh, they begged them to preach to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes, uh, that means Gentiles who had become Jews, uh, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So the audience that heard Paul's sermon was divided. Many Jews, as well as Gentiles, who were practicing Judaism, uh, believed the message of grace greater than the law, uh, while many others were enraged at what Paul had preached. Verse 44, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. That's what Jesus asked his followers to do, to first of all, preach to the, to the nation of Israel, the people from whose uh, background was from Israel, to preach to them first uh, and then go on to the Gentiles. But uh, uh, so they... Uh, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you would be for salvation to the ends of the earth. That's a quotation from Isaiah uh, chapter 49, verse 6. Now, it's interesting that the Jews did not get mad until they saw how many were responding to the gospel of grace filled with jealousy, especially that the Gentiles uh, in large numbers were coming to the Lord. And they opposed, then opposed Paul and Barnabas. And when it says they blasphemed, it's likely that they were cursing the name of Jesus uh, and uh, saying Jesus is accursed. Now, and he deals with that later in his writings, Paul does, but uh, the quotation from Isaiah is very interesting here in that we discovered why God, what call, God called the Jews to do, what God called the people of Israel to do. Uh, you know, the people of Israel were not always called Jews. People from Judea were. But eventually it came to be a name referring to all of Israel uh, in the New Testament time. Uh, but uh, so uh, they, they were called to something. And what was it? They were called to, they were set, God said, you, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles. So the calling of the, of the Jews, of the people of Israel, was to proclaim the good news of God to the Gentile world. Paul's doing that. And yet they were resisting and opposing what he was doing, even though that was their calling through the words of the prophet Isaiah, that they, the people of Israel, should be doing that very thing all along. So they should have celebrated that the Gentiles had received God's grace for salvation instead of being enraged about it. Verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and it came to, and then came to Iconium. 
And so we see that the Jews were mad, but the Gentiles were glad. Uh, and this was a turning point uh, for the Gentiles to receive the grace of God and the message of God. Uh, we also see here that Paul and Barnabas did just as Jesus had taught his disciples to do, is that when your message is not received, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Don't be trying to make something happen that's not going to happen. You know, just uh, move on to somebody who's receptive to the gospel and see what happens from there. So they moved on to Iconium. Verse 52, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. As with every other time, there were new believers. These believers uh, at, uh, in, in this region were also filled with the Holy Spirit. And so you see this same thing happening over again. There's not a change. With every new gathering of believers, new believers, the Holy Spirit comes and fills them with His presence. Uh, and, and we also see here that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to simultaneously be filled with joy. Uh, the disciples were strengthened by the joy of the Lord. Uh, being in the presence of God, listen, it produces joy. So they, spent, they were spending a lot of time in the presence of the Lord. And these people who had received God's grace, these Gentiles, uh, received the Holy Spirit, and the overflow of joy was one of the first things they experienced. And I'm sure the love of God was manifested among them too, where they began to be different people than they had been before. There was a transformation of their souls. They became uh, people of God's love as well. Now next week we're going to more closely explore Paul's sermon here and the effect it had on these Gentiles, especially with the overflow of joy. And then the grace, there's a thread of grace all through his sermon that I want to show you next week. Uh, and that uh, what he's building up is the message of God's grace uh, that, that the Lord had shown him. So the message of grace is threaded all through the sermon. For our closing application today, I want to draw our attention back to how the believers at Antioch, while they were fasting and praying, heard from the Holy Spirit concerning the will of God. The point is that their hearts were open to hear from God. They believed that the will and wisdom of God could be given to them when they asked for it. The question we have for all of us is, do we believe that too? Do we believe that God can enter into our thoughts and give, his, give an understanding of His will and wisdom about something? Well, see, if we really, really believe that, Let's go ahead and ask for it when we need a question answered. You know, when we have confusion, we're, when we're in a fog, because what is, what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's the fog lifter, you know. He lifts the fog so we can see where we're going, you know. So ask. I'm reminded of what James wrote in his epistle, James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The believers at Antioch did this, they asked, and they believed God would answer. Are any of us in need of more understanding and wisdom about some matter? You don't have to raise your hand, but I bet there are people here. You're sitting there and you're going, I don't know what I'm going to do about this situation. Uh, this is all a big fog to me as to what I should do. I'm, I'm confused and there's a matter I'm trying to figure out and, and I just don't know what to do or where to go and how to put things together. So the question is, uh, are we facing something like that? Uh, let's ask for God's wisdom. If you're faced with something like that, ask Him, and God will answer. Proverbs 8, 17, that uh, kind of personified wisdom, said, I, wisdom, love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Then Proverbs 2, 6 says, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now, how does God answer when we ask him for wisdom and for his understanding? Well, just as with those believers in Antioch, the Holy Spirit is within us. As Jesus promised to dwell in us, uh, to speak God's thoughts into our hearts with whatever wise counsel that we need. James went on to write when he talked about asking for wisdom. He said, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. So we are to ask for wisdom and for understanding through the Holy Spirit without doubting. 
the word doubting means to discriminate, to already have our minds made up, to have a preference already as to where we want to go and what we want to do. You know, Paul wanted to do something. He'll tell about this later. He wanted to go somewhere one time and minister, and the Holy Spirit says constrained him from going there and sent him somewhere else. And he was sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to listen and to go where the Holy Spirit was leading him to go instead of to where he had already made up his mind to go. Guys, how often do we make up our minds and when we go to God and say, oh, please, please say amen to what I want to do, Lord? You know, please say, okay, go. <laughs> That's what you want to do, you know. Better to say to the Lord, what do you want me to do? Show me, Lord. I'm willing to lay down my plan and listen to you. So uh, we are to ask without doubting. Uh, so God does not bend to our preferences. Uh, he doesn't answer us with our strings attached to the answer. You know, uh, he wants to tell us himself because he sees down the road. He sees through the fog. He sees the road ahead. While they were fasting and praying, I believe those Antioch believers reached a point of surrender to the opinions of God above their own. They may have had other ideas other than Paul and Barnabas being sent out. But as they prayed and fasted, it became clear that Paul and Barnabas were the ones to go. They agreed to follow whatever counsel the Holy Spirit gave them. Then whatever certainty there was cleared away like the lifting of a fog, and they could see what needed to be done. And so then they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. Because that's what God wanted to do. Stand with me this morning. And as we close the service, I, I, I want to pray for anybody here who's kind of in a fog about something. I've been there many times. There's no apology needed for that. Uh, you know. I have a little bit of fog about every week <laughs> about something, you know. And then as I pray and I ask God to help me see, the fog lifts and I can see where he wants to go. You know, one of the things I would encourage you to do, when I was a young guy, I was impulsive. I made decisions too quickly. I reacted to people. I let my emotions rule over me, you know. And as I've gotten older and more understanding of the way God works, I have learned to never do a knee-jerk reaction to anything, you know, but to wait, wait, and let the Lord reveal what needs to come next. Because I'll tell you, when you wait, you're asking God, Lord, I give you opportunity, I give you an invitation to open the, the way that's best. So hit the pause button. You know, hit the pause button. Don't react to, to things. Don't react to people. Don't react to somebody's opinion about something. You know, don't do that. You do, this is not the book of reacts. You know, it's the book of Acts. I dare say it wouldn't be in the Bible if it was a book of reactions. You know, but it's a book of action action of the Holy Spirit. Father, today I want to lift up anybody in our gathering here and even those who are following on the streaming or those who will listen in this coming week or two. We just pray, God, for those who are in a fog, uh, needing understanding about something, that you will use what we've heard today about what happened in Antioch how the Holy Spirit spoke to them and set them apart and sent them out, Lord. How you lifted the fog of confusion and showed them what was ahead. Uh, well, who to choose, who to send out. So, Lord, if somebody's in the valley of decision and there's lots of fog there, I pray that you would begin to lift the fog as they wait upon you and seek your voice, seek your wisdom, that it would become clear to them, Lord, what is your will? I pray that your familiar voice would be heard and that your peace would dwell in each heart as they find that place, that spot of surrender and understanding It will have a peace attached to it that's marvelous. And that your word would even confirm it, Lord, as we know that your will does not conflict with your word and so your word would even confirm it. 
And Lord, that each one would be able to say, this is what the Lord is leading me to do because I have that peace that's beyond human understanding that's guarding my heart and my mind and giving me the green light to move on, move ahead. So Lord, be with each one. I pray for those who are in a fog of strong emotions, disappointment, discouragement, hurt, that your Holy Spirit would minister healing and help and that you would come upon them, Lord, in a way that brings comfort and help them, Lord, to just wait and not react to the emotions but to wait upon you for that healing. I pray, for Lord, for those who are being bombarded by the opinions of others that your voice would be heard above all those other voices, that you would give your guidance and wisdom so that when you say, it's time to go, it's time to do this, it's time to make this plan, that they will know that's from you. Thank you, Lord, for being such a personal God that you speak to us, that you set us apart for ministry, that you send us out that you minister in such a personal way to each person. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. We worship you today with all of our hearts. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're just going to be still before you in the coming days to hear from you what you have to say. In our Christ Jesus' name, amen.